This video is Chapter 12, Mobile, Linux, and Mac Operating Systems. In Chapter 12, we're going to look at mobile operating systems, methods for securing mobile devices, the Linux and Mac operating systems, and basic troubleshooting processes for other operating systems. Mobile operating systems. Two of the terms you need to be familiar with in this course is open source versus closed source. Open source is software um, that is, the code can be seen by everyone. Desktops and laptops, mobile devices, they all use some type of operating system to run the software. And then before users can analyze and modify software, they must be able to see the source code. And open source software is where you can see the source code. So when developers are choosing to provide source code, the software is said to be open. If the developers choose to close the code or so it can't be seen, it's considered to be closed source. Android is developed by Google, and iOS is developed by Apple. Apps are written and compiled for a specific mobile operating system, such as Apple, iOS, or Android, or Windows. Mobile devices come with a number of different apps pre-installed to provide basic functionality. Essentially, what the uh, providers are doing is putting apps on there beforehand because they're paid uh, to put those apps on the phones or the mobile devices. And there's apps that make phone calls, send and receive, email, listen to music, take pictures, play video, or video games. So instead of being installed from an optical disk, apps are downloaded from a content source. Apps for the Apple iOS mobile device are available for free or for purchase through the App Store. Apple uses a walled garden model for their apps, meaning that apps must be submitted to and approved by Apple before they're released to the users. And that's so that they say so they can help prevent the spread of malware and malicious code. And then Android apps are available from both Google Play and third-party sites such as Amazon's App Store, or you can install them off of other sites. You just need to be careful about that. Android apps run in a sandbox and have only privileges enabled by the users. And third-party or custom programs are installed directly using an Android application package or APK file. This gives users the ability to directly install apps without going through a storefront interface, and it's known as sideloading. The Android main home screen, you have one screen is designated as the home screen, and then additional screens are accessed by sliding the home screen to the left or the right. And you also have navigation icons. The Android OS uses the system bar to navigate apps and screens, and the system bar contains the following buttons, back, home, recent apps, and menu. You can also have notification and system icons. Each Android device has an area that contains systems icons such as the clock, battery status, status of Wi-Fi, and the provider networks. Apps such as email, text, Facebook are often displayed icons to indicate communication activity. And to open the notification area on Android, just swipe down from the top of the screen and you can do the following when notifications are open. You can respond to the notification, you can dismiss it, you can dismiss all notifications, you can toggle often used settings, you can adjust the brightness of the screen, or you can open the settings menu with the quick settings icon. On the iOS interface, the iOS interface works in much the same way as the Android does, but there are some differences. You have no navigation icons. A physical button may have to be pressed instead of touching the navigation icons. There's no widgets. Only apps and other content can be installed on iOS device screens. And there's no app shortcuts. Each app on a home screen is the actual app, not a shortcut. You also have a home button. So unlike Android devices, uh, they do not use navigation icons to perform functions. So some of the common functions performed by the home button include waking the device, returning to the home screen, or starting the Siri, vo Siri voice control. On the iOS notification center, iOS devices have notification centers that display all alerts in one location. And commonly used settings, um, iOS devices have um, allow users to quickly access common settings and switches even while locked. And from the commonly used settings screen, a user can toggle often uh, use settings such as airplane mode, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, do not disturb, and screen, roca screen rotation lock. You can adjust the screen brightness, control the music player, access airdrop, access the flashlight, clock, calendar, and camera. And then iOS Spotlight shows suggestions from many sources including the internet, iTunes, App Store, Movie Store, and nearby locations. The screen rotation, most mobile devices can be used in either portrait or landscape mode. A sensor inside the device known as an accelerometer detects how it's being held and will change the screen orientation appropriately. When the device is turned to landscape mode, the camera app also turns to landscape mode. And some devices also have gyroscopes. 
to provide more accurate movement readings, and gyroscopes will allow a device to be used as a control mechanism for driving games where the device itself acts as a steering wheel. The Android screen auto rotation setting. Uh, when using the Android device, you can enable auto automation or automatic rotation. You go to settings, display, advanced, auto rotate. On the iOS, um, to enable automatic rotation, you swipe up from the very bottom of the screen and tap the lock icon. You can calibrate the screen. When bright sunlight makes the screen difficult to read, you can increase the brightness level. Or you can, in very low, uh, when, when things are really bright, uh, or when very low brightness or low light, it's helpful when reading a book on a mobile device at night to turn, it, turn the brightness down. And some mobile devices can be configured to auto-adjust the brightness depending on the amount of surrounding light. The device must have a light sensor to use auto-brightness. The Android brightness menu, uh, you can configure that by going to settings, display brightness, and then slide the brightness to the desired level. And on the iOS, you can swipe up from the bottom of the screen and slide the brightness bar up or down to vary the brightness. GPS or Global Positioning System, it's a navigation system that determines the time and geographical location of the device by using messages from satellites in space and a receiver on Earth. A GPS radio receiver uses at least four satellites to calculate its position based on the messages. GPS services allow apps, vendors, and websites to know the location of a device and offer location-specific services, which is called geotracking. Indoor positioning systems can determine device location by triangulating its proximity to other radio signals such as Wi-Fi access points. And Android location services to enable GPS on Android, go to settings, locations, tap on the toggle to turn on location services, and on iOS you go to settings, privacy, location services, and turn on location services. Wi-Fi calling, instead of using the cell carrier's network, modern smartphones can use the internet to transport voice calls by taking advantage of local Wi-Fi hotspots. If there's no Wi-Fi hotspot within reach, the phone will then use the cell carrier's network. But Wi-Fi calling is useful in areas with poor cell coverage because it uses local Wi-Fi hotspots to fill the gaps in. And the Wi-Fi hotspot must be able to guarantee a throughput of at least one megabyte to the internet for good quality. So on calling uh, Wi-Fi calling on Android, you go to settings, more, Wi-Fi calling. On iOS, you go to settings, phone, internal to Wi-Fi calling. You can use near field communications for payments. You have premium SMS-based transactional payments. Consumers send an SMS message to a carrier's special phone number containing a payment request, and the seller is informed the payment has been received and it's cleared to release the goods. You have direct mobile billing. That's using a mobile billing option during checkout. A user identifies their self, usually through two-factor authentication, and allows the charge to be added to the mobile service bill. You have mobile web payments. The consumer uses the web or dedicated apps to complete the transaction, or you have NFC or contactless NFC. And this method, method is used mostly in physical store transactions where a consumer pays for goods or services by waving the phone near the payment system. A virtual private network, or VPN, is a private network that uses a public network, usually the internet, to connect to remote sites. A lot of companies use their own VPNs to accommodate the needs of remote employees and distance offices. When a VPN is established from a client to a server, the client accesses the network behind the server as if it was connected directly to that network. And because VPN protocols are also allow for data encryption, the communication between client servers is secure. And to configure a VPN connection on Android, you go to um, Settings, More, VPN, tap on the plus sign to add a VPN connection. And on the iOS, you go to Settings, General, VPN, and add the VPN configuration. You have virtual assistants, a digital assistant, sometimes called a virtual assistant. It's a program that can understand natural conversational language, and it performs tasks for the end user. These digital assistants can rely on artificial intelligence, machine learning, and voice recognition technology to understand conversational style voice commands. Uh, by pairing simple voice requests with other inputs, such as GPS location, these assistants can perform several tasks like turning on lights, playing songs, playing videos, doing web searches, taking notes, or sending email. On the Android side, you have Google Now. That's on Android devices. You simply say, OK, Google, and Google Now will activate and start listening to requests. On Siri, yeah, there you go. And for Siri, on an iOS device, you press and hold the home button, and Siri will activate and start listening to requests. Alternatively, Siri can be configured to start listening when it hears, hey, Siri. Methods for securing mobile devices. 
You can put restrictions on failed login attempts. When a passcode has been configured, unlocking a mobile phone device requires entering the correct PIN, password pattern, or face recognition. In theory, a passcode such as a PIN could be guessed given enough time. And to prevent someone from trying to guess a passcode, mobile devices can be set to perform defined actions after a certain number of incorrect attempts have been made. It's common that Android device will lock when a passcode has failed from 4 to 12 times. And after a device is locked, you can unlock it by entering the Gmail account information used to set up the device. On iOS, if the passcode fails 10 times, the screen goes blank and all the data on the device is deleted. And to restore the iOS device and data, use the Restore and Backup option in iTunes or iCloud. On the iOS GUI, to increase security, the passcode is used as part of the encryption key for the entire system. You can do remote backup. A remote backup is when a device copies its data to the cloud storage using a backup app. If data needs to be restored, run the backup app and access the website to retrieve the data. Most mobile operating systems come with user account linked to the vendor's cloud services such as iCloud, Google Sync, or OneDrive for Microsoft. The user enables automatic backups to the cloud for data apps and settings, and then restores when needed. There's also third-party backup providers such as Dropbox that can be used. Another option is to configure the mobile device management or MDM software to automatically back up user devices. There are locator apps on mobile devices. If a mobile device is misplaced or stolen, it's possible it can be found using a locator app. A locator app should be installed and configured on each mobile device before it is lost, obviously. And both Android and iOS have apps for remote locating a device. Android Device Manager allows a user to locate, ring, or lock a lost Android device or to erase data from the device. And iOS users can use the Find My iPhone app and do the same thing. So after a device is located, you might be able to perform additional functions such as sending a message or playing a sound or give that information over to your local law enforcement so that they can track the device and try to recover it for you. You can do remote lock and remote wipe. If, an at if attempts to locate a mobile device have failed, there are other security features that can prevent data from being compromised. Two of the most common are remote lock. iOS is lost mode. Android is lock. It allows you to lock the device with a passcode so others cannot gain access to the data on the device. Or you can do a remote wipe. And on iOS, that's erase phone. And on Android, it's erase. The remote wipe feature deletes all data from the device and returns it to a factory state. And to restore the data on the device, Android users must set up the device using a Gmail account. And iOS users must synchronize their device using iTunes. Smartphones and other devi mobile devices are vulnerable to malicious software. So depending upon the permissions granted to the antivirus apps when they're installed on an Android device, the app might not be able to scan files automatically or run scheduled scans. So iOS does not allow automatic or scheduled scans. This is a safety feature to prevent malicious programs from using unauthorized resources or contaminating other apps on the iOS. And mobile devices apps run in a sandbox. So a sandbox is a location of the OS that keeps code isolated from other resources and other code. And it's difficult for malicious programs to infect a mobile device because apps are run inside those sandboxes. And to prevent malicious programs from infecting additional devices, a firewall can be used. You have routing and jailbreaking. Mobile operating systems are usually protected by a number of software restrictions by the manufacturer. An unmodified copy of iOS, for example, will only execute the authorized code and allow very limited users access, access um, information on the file system. So, rooting and jailbreaking are two methods for removing restrictions and protections added to mobile operating systems. Rooting is used on Android devices to gain privilege and root level access for modifying code or installing software that is not intended for the device. And jailbreaking is typically used on iOS devices to remove manufacturer restrictions allowing them to run user code, grant full access, and full access to the kernel modules. But by rooting and jailbreaking on mobile devices, the GUI can be customized. Modifications can be made to the operating system to improve speed and responsiveness, and apps can be installed from secondary or unsupported sources. Just like operating systems on desktops or laptops, you can update or patch the operating system on mobile devices. Updates add functionality or increase performance or decrease performance depending upon the manufacturer and what they're doing with their operating system. Patches can fix security problems or issue hard, issue, uh, fix issues with hardware and software. Android updates and patches use an automated process for delivery. When a carrier or manufacturer has an update for a device, a notification pops up and lets you know that it's going to be taking place. iOS updates also use an automated process for delivery. And similar to Android, a notice uh, to the user downloads uh, and pops up on the phone. And there's two types of uh, updates for mobile device radio firmware. You have the preferred roaming list. That's a configuration information that a cell phone needs to communicate on networks. And then you have the primary rate, ISDN, 
and the PRI configures the data rates between the device and the cell tower. Linux and Mac OS operating systems. Unix is a proprietary operating system written in the C programming language. Mac OS and iOS are based on the Berkeley standard distribution version of Unix, BSD. And Linux is the operating system. It's, it's a used embed, in embedded systems, wearable, wearable devices, smartwatches, cell phones, netbooks, PCs, and servers. There's many different distributions or what we call distros of Linux, including SUSE, Red Hat, CentOS, Fedora, Debian, Ubuntu, and Mint. Android and many other operating system distributions rely heavily upon the Linux kernel. The Mac operating system for Mac computers is developed from the Unix kernel, so all of these operating systems are cousins of each other. It is, however, a closed source operating system, and Mac OS supports the remote network installation called Netboot. Now, when you're looking at the Linux GUI or graphical user interface, it's going to depend on which GUI you install. There's different graphical user interfaces for Linux. District distributions ship with different software packages, but then the user gets to customize what stays with their system and what gets installed. The graphical interface in Linux is comprised of a number of subsystems that can be removed or replaced by the user. Ubuntu uses Unity as its default GUI. And then Linux GUI has the ability to have multiple desktops or workspaces. Canonical or Canonical has a website that simulates Unity's UI and also provides a tour through the Unity's main features. And to experience Unity, you can go to their website. An overview of the Mac OS GUI. Um, the big major differences between older versions of OS X and Mac OS is the addition of the Aqua GUI. With Mac OS, Mission Control is a quick way to see everything that's currently open. Mission Control allows you to organize your apps on multiple desktops. And to navigate the file system, Mac OS includes Finder. Finder is very similar to the Windows File Explorer. And Mac OS also allows screen sharing. Screen sharing is a feature that lets other people using Macs to be able to view your screen or even take control of your computer. The Linux and Mac OS command line interface. In both Linux and Mac, the user can communicate with the operating system by using the CLI or command line interface. To add flexibility, commands or tools that support parameters, options, and switches are usually preceded by the dash character. Most operating systems include a graphical interface, and although a command line interface is still present, the OS often boots into the GUI by default. One way to access the command line interface in a GUI-based operating system is through a terminal or terminal emulator application. These applications provide user access to the command line and are often named as some variation of the word terminal. A program called a shell interprets the commands from the keyboard and passes them to the operating system. When a user successfully logs into the system, the login program starts the shell. Afterwards, an authorized user can begin to interacting with the OS through the text-based commands. Users interact with the kernel through a shell. The kernel is responsible for allocating CPU time and memory to processes, and the kernel also manages the file system and communicates in response to system calls. Now, the Mac OS term terminal emulator includes a terminal emulator called Terminal, but a number of third-party emulators are also available. On Linux, you can do backup and recovery, and the process of backing up data refers to creating a copy of data for safekeeping. When the backup of processes is complete, the copy is called a backup. Now, while backups can be achieved with a simple copy command, many tools and techniques exist to the user for processing automatic and transparent uh, backups. Linux does not have a built-in backup tool. However, there are many commercial and open source backup solutions from Linux, such as Amanda, Bacula, FW Backups, and Deja Dupe. Mac OS includes a backup tool called Time Machine. With Time Machine, users can choose an external drive to be used as a backup destination. The Time Machine will prepare the disk to receive backups, and when the disk is ready, it performs incremental backups periodically. Time Machine also stores some backups on your Mac, so if the Time Machine backup disk is not available, you may be able to restore backup directly from your Mac location. To help diagnose and solve disk-related problems, most modern operating systems include some type of disk utility tools. Ubuntu Linux includes a disk utility tool called Disk. With disk, users uh, can perform the most common disk-related task, including partition management, mount or unmount, formatting disk, query analysis, and reporting technology, or SMART. On the Mac side, there's a main disk maintenance task, disk utility. It also supports verify disk permissions and repair disk. You also have repair disk permission, which is a common troubleshooting step in the Mac OS. And disk utility can be used to back up disk to manage image files, image files perform an image recovery, to disk from image files.
A few common maintenance tasks that can be performed using disk utility software. You can do partition management, mounting or unmounting disk partitions, formatting disk, checking bad sectors, or querying smart attributes. You can also schedule tasks. Maintenance tasks should be scheduled and performed frequently to prevent or detect problems. To avoid missing maintenance tasks due to human error, computer systems can be programmed to perform tasks automatically. Two tasks that should be scheduled and performed automatically are backups and disk, check, and disk checks. In Linux and Mac, the cron service is responsible for scheduled tasking. As a service, cron runs in the background and executes tasks at specific dates and times. And cron uses a scheduled table, used a cron table, you called a cron table, that can be edited with the cron tab command. When systems get updated, they're known as patches. OS updates are released periodically by OS companies to address known vulnerabilities. While companies have update schedules, the release of unscheduled OS updates is common when there's a major vulnerability that's found in the OS code and needs to be patched immediately. You also have firmware updates. Those are usually held in non-volatile memory such as ROM or Flash. Firmware is a type of software designed for to provide or it's designed to provide low-level functionality for a device. You also have antivirus and anti-malware. That relies on code signatures to operate. Signatures or signature files are files containing a sample of the code used by viruses and malwares, and the software checks for those signatures. New malware is created and released every day. Therefore, the signature files need to be updated continuously. With security, usernames, passwords, and digital certificates, encryption keys are just a few of the security credentials associated to a user. Due to the increasing number of necessary security credentials, Modern operating systems include a service to manage them. Applications and other services can then request and utilize the credentials stored by the security credentials um, manager service. Security, um, security credentials service on Ubuntu. The genome key ring is a security credentials manager for Ubuntu. To access the genome key ring to, um, on Linux, click dash, look for key, and then click passwords and keys. On the macOS, Keychain is a security credential for macOS. To access the Keychain on Mac, go to Applications, Utilities, and Keychain Access. I personally use an app called Bitwarden to secure my credentials. The ls-i command is for output. Uh, what this does is this shows permissions, defines how the user group or other access has access to the files and directories, link, the number of links, the number of directories inside that directory, the user, the group, the file size, the date and time, and the file name. Some basic Unix file and directory permissions. To organize the system and reinforce boundaries within the system, Unix uses file permissions. Every file and directory on the Unix systems carries its permissions, which define the actions that the owner, the group, and others can do with the file or directory. The only user who can override the file permission in Unix is the root user. Root access is often required before performing maintenance and administrative tasks on a Unix system. Some Linux administrative commands, you can do passwd, that allows users to change their own password at the terminal. ps, allows users to monitor their own processes. kill, will stop a process. ifconfig is similar to the ipconfig on Windows, but it runs, the, it's called ifconfig on the Linux side. iwconfig, allows users to set and view their wireless settings. And ch mode, allows users to change their permissions of files that they own. For Linux administrative commands that require root access, you need to use the terminal and then you have to go into root first using the sudo command or super user do. It grants a user root access without actually changing their profile. chown allows users to switch both the owner and the group of file or files. apt-get is used to install and manage software on the Debian based Linux distributions. Shutdown is used to halt and reboot the operating system and DD is a disk duplicate that's used to copy files and partitions and create temporary swap files. Basic troubleshooting processes. These are the same six steps that we've been using in each chapter. I'm just going to pause briefly on each screen. You can pause the video to read each one of these questions and steps.